very last session, and yet a, the most um, relevant, because knowing everything and hearing everything that we have uh, today, unless we manage our time, it's of no use. And we have uh, to conduct a fourth session of the day, a man who needs no introduction, senior pastor of All People's Church, Pastor Ashish Raichu. But for the 20% of you who don't know much about him, uh, Pastor Ashish is a man who is not only a man of the word, but a man of his word, who um, desired to do ministry from the age of 13 and has continued to do so. So for all of us who watch him, he is a true inspiration. And uh, I can think of Paul who said, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. I'm so glad that we have a living example before us. Um, Pastor has a Master of Science degree in Biomedical Engineering. He worked in the IT industry for 18 years, 13 of which were spent running his own technology business. And he pioneered APC in 2001. Um, he's been with APC full-time since June 2014. Please welcome Pastor Ashish. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here at the 2023 Christian Professionals Conference. And uh, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, those of our, our speakers for today, uh, Rajiv. Uh, Rajiv, uh, thank you for being with us. And Deepa, Deepa is right here, Deepa Chandrasekhar, and of course, our very own Edwin James. <laughs> Where's Edwin? I don't know. Let's give them a good hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, the few moments I had with people, and uh, they were just good reports. They really enjoyed their time here. I also want to thank uh, Ratna and Viveka for heading this. I don't know where are they. Uh, this Ratna and Viveka, thank you. Thank you for leading the uh, Christian Professionals Ministry here at All People's Church for coordinating, and also all our staff and volunteers, because it was a team effort. So let's put our hands together. Thank you, all the volunteers, all the staff. I really appreciate you for, um, you know, putting this together. And it's our opportunity to uh, serve Christian professionals, those of you who are in the marketplace doing things and at, at the same time seeking to glorify Jesus. Um, I apologize I couldn't be here during the uh, first half. I had some responsibilities at home, and so Amy was at work, and so I had to stay home. And then when Amy came home, I was relieved to uh, come and be here. Uh, we just had to take care of Dad, so somebody had to be at home uh, all the time. So we're kind of just uh, sharing these responsibilities. Okay, so the topic that was given to me for this uh, session, the last session today, uh, is about managing time. And... Uh, uh, hopefully, th this will be of some interest to you after all the wonderful things you heard this morning and this afternoon. Um, we'll begin with um, a few scriptures, just think about it, and then we'll get into some practical things that which hopefully we'll uh, be able to take away with us. So Ephesians 5, 15 to 17, I'm, I'm using the uh, English Standard Version here. Uh, the Apostle Paul tells us, he says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. In other words, you know, be careful how you live your life. Don't live foolishly. Uh, live with wisdom, is what he's saying. So be careful how you're living your life. And then he says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. So make the best of your time. And it's very interesting, you know, what he's saying in that one sentence. Make the most of your time. Why? Because the days are evil, meaning there are all kinds of bad things that will try to consume your time. Right? There may be all kinds of things that are going to try to destroy, uh, just take away your time. The days are evil. There are lots of things around us which are unproductive, not useful, and they're there to try and consume your time. So therefore, he says, making the best use of your time. The King James, we read it, it says, redeeming the time. It's a stronger word. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. 
And in that context, being careful how you live your life and taking, making good use of your time, in that context, he continues in verse 17, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So in order for me to make sure I live properly and I make the most of my time, it's dependent on me knowing God's purpose. And we had a very first session this morning on God's purpose or knowing God's will. That knowing God's will is going to help us do these first two things. Live properly, uh, make good use of our time. So you can just summarize it. Live with wisdom, make the best use of time, and understand God's will, God's purpose. Three things he's saying. And Paul repeats this in Colossians 4.15. He says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. So again, look at the context. Make good use of your time. Walk with wisdom with those outside, meaning people who don't necessarily share the same values, who don't share kingdom values, who are not pursuing the same things you and I are pursuing. Again, make the best use of your time. So that means I can't necessarily order my time exactly the way people around me are ordering their time because their priorities are different. So walk with wisdom to those who are outside not of the same faith, and in that context, make the best use of your time. So you just put it in simple English in our language. We'd say, manage your time well. Manage your time well. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I quote some, you know, non-Christian people and say, oh, I went to a Christian conference. He's <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Sometimes people, you know, get allergies, and so... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if you're allergic to non-Christian quotes, just ignore these things, okay? But Peter Drucker was a very, very well-known established management guru. He passed on, but uh, still people still read his books. And he made a simple statement. He said, until we manage time, we can manage nothing else. So imagine the top management guru saying, hey, first thing you need to get down is manage time. Then you can manage people. You can manage businesses. You can manage organizations. You can do everything else. First thing, learn how to manage time. So this is very important. Now, I want you to think about this, that the way we use our time, it describes who we are. And it's going to actually shape what we become. That's really crucial. How, what you're doing with your time it's describing who you really are, and it's also shaping what you're becoming. So this is serious stuff. You've got to take care of this. Okay? And our goal is not just to spend time. What do you think time passes? It's waiting time to pass. <laughs> no, your goal is not time pass. It's not just spending time. It, look at time as something you can invest you can invest, and you know you can get rich dividends out of that. Uh, whatever you're pursuing, not necessarily doesn't always have to be the dividends. Doesn't always have to be money, although that's important. But so our goal is to invest our time so that there's going to be a multiplication factor. There's going to be something good coming out of how we use our time. Having said that, and we're going to talk about time management. And as believers, we also know there's another aspect that is outside our control. And the psalmist put it like this. He said, my times are in your hands. Okay? So we're saying manage time. So don't think that, hey, I'm in full control. No. There are so many things that are outside our control. This is the other side, where my times are in God's hands. Okay? So uh, there's a realm where we are determining what we do with our time. And that's what we're talking about. But as believers, we're also very conscious that there's a realm that's in God's hands. Right? My times are in God's hands. He is doing so much more. He's orchestrating things in our lives. He's ordering the seasons of our lives. Uh, he's guiding us. And, and he, he's got, got that part. Right? So that is something we walk by faith. We trust. We rely on God. We leave that part, what's in his hands, we leave that in his hands. What we're going to talk about is what we can do, which is on our side, what we can control or what God has made us responsible for. So very quickly, 
Uh, why are we talking about time management? Why, why is this so important? We already stressed on it earlier, made some comments here, but practically, um, we want to manage time well because it's going to maximize productivity. What you make out of your time, like what comes out of your time, that's in your hands. You know, how productive you are, how productively you're working or living your life, that's dependent on managing your time. Of course, if you manage time, uh, it can reduce a lot of stress. Uh, and those of you, know, those of you I, I should say you, now I'm not there, but those of you <laughs> in the corporate world, you, un you understand how stressful things can be. And you have tight deadlines, deliveries to make, uh, uh, targets to meet, and so on. It can reduce stress. And of course, uh, I think one thing we all look for is to have a healthy work-life balance. I'm able to do my work and I also do all the other things that I need to be doing. Uh, which is maybe family and hobbies and whatever else that might be important to us. So as believers, we're, of course, talking about our relationship with God and time with church. Um, this is a thought. It's, it's pretty obvious, but sometimes we need to state the obvious to wake people up. Time is more important than money. You can earn money, but there's no place where you can go buy time. So, that's something that's kind of God has sinking, right? Time is more important than money. You can always make ways to earn more money, but you can't buy time. So, um, what I want to talk about is just share some practices for managing time. And uh, I'll be sharing seven practices So, we'll be talking about these seven. First, we'll talk about an overarching principle. Um, again, these are things that I find useful for. Many of you probably know it already. Um, so, you might find it, okay, something, uh, or just a reminder. Uh, we'll talk about an overarching, overarching principle that helps us in managing our time. Second, plan your year, month, week, and day in that order. Leverage technology to improve efficiency and productivity. Organize your world, especially a digital world. Uh, think laterally. Uh, I'll explain what it is. Reflect, reprioritize, reorder often, as often as you need it. And number seven, we'll talk about life plan. Now, and then hopefully at the end, we'll have maybe about 15, 20 minutes for question and answers. And you're welcome to ask questions. Now... As we go through this, I'm going to be sharing some personal examples, whatever uh, we can. Uh, remember, those personal examples are only personal examples. They're not, this is God speaking. No. <laughs> it's just, okay, this is how I've applied it in my life. Okay? And I'm not presenting it as, okay, all of you have to do this when you come from tomorrow onwards. That's not how I'm presenting it. I'm just, when I start, talk about personal examples, I'm just saying, this is how it's worked in my life. How it works in your life may be very different. And it's okay, right? Because God works in a variety of ways. It's not like he's got the only one way to work these things. He's a, he's, he's a very creative God. So when I share personal stories or personal examples, just to, you know, see if it, it's, you can connect with it, see if you can take some ideas from it. But I'm not saying you have to do it exactly the way I've done it or I practice it. The first overarching, first one, the overarching principle that really helped me, and if you want to think about life, uh, you could do it this way. I like to look at life as being lived in seasons. And every season has a purpose or a set of purposes. It could have more than one purpose. And most often, there is more than one purpose in a season. So every season has a set of purposes. And in order to manage time well, I have to do two things. I need to maintain my priorities and my practices and keep them aligned to the purpose or the set of purposes for that season. Very simple. We can go home now. You've got, <laughs> you've got what you need. Right? Make sure you keep your priorities and practices aligned to that purpose during that season. So if I look at my own journey, uh, early school days, well, purpose, you know, first do your studies, grow with your faith. So I had 
at walk, walk with God studies, and I also started ministering at, you know, at early age. So there was ministry running in parallel. So from the age of 13, I was busy in Bangalore City, running around and preaching in different schools and conducting Bible studies and all of those things. So I have managed my time between my personal walk with God, you know, what you do, what, what you would do as a student, and as well as ministry. And as a student, I was, you know, studies and sports. These were like two big things. Then went to college. Again, the same thing. Maintain my walk with God. Do what you would do in college life. In those days, uh, I would do my studies, and I kind of focused on athletics. I kind of gave up on soccer. That was taking too much time. So athletics was something I could control my time. So I focused on that during college days. And then I was doing ministry. Started a fellowship there on campus, and that grew. Went for graduate studies. Again, what were my priorities? Walk with God. Uh, my studies, now I had to do work as well. I had to do research in the lab. So, and I was also, you know, at, there were times when I was working for some companies. And so I had to do research and also ministry. So I started ministry to international students. Um, later on, got involved in some local churches doing ministry. So I had to manage my time. And those were priorities. I had to do that. Then early career, started working, quickly got married in a hurry. And <laughs> uh, so now life changed, a different season. Um, I had to manage my walk with God, marriage uh, with Amy, work, working there in IT, and ministry. Uh, we were ministering in church at that time. We actually started pioneering a bilingual English-Spanish church uh, in the U.S. So that was the early stage of career. That's what was going on. Later on, Josh and Ruth came. And so now season changed. Now it's family. And it is also the time we moved to India. So again, things changed. In this season, I had to focus on walk with God, family now. It was wife and children. And then we were pioneering a church. This was 2001. Church started. And at the same time, business started. So I was not employed, but I was, uh, I was, I was not working for somebody else. I was self-employed, now employing others. And so there was business to take care of. Uh, so that was a totally different season. Um, and that went on for about 14 years, 14 some years. And then children grew up, went to college, and also things changed. Um, uh, I came out of business and started focusing on the church. Church began to grow. And so many things, you know, college, Bible college, and other things were happening in church, taking all the time. So that's kind of the season in which I'm in. And when I look ahead, so what, what, how will this season change? You know, maybe I would transition out of church, hand it off to some of the younger people, and then be more kind of in the background, uh, continue to serve the Lord. Not, uh, you don't retire from ministry, you re <laughs> but, you know, the church will be run by the younger generation, and I would probably be in the background and, you know, just mentoring and nurturing these young leaders. So that's probably the season up ahead. So why did I kind of go through that in detail? It's because this is how I'm thinking, how I'm looking at life. And maybe it might help you to look at life like this. And every time I recognize the season, then I know what my priorities are, and I know what practices I need to maintain. And then I begin to order time around it. So Stephen Covey, um, so, so, so that brings us to the next point. You're with me so far? Feels like Sunday morning service. You're with me? <laughs> I have to remind myself, this is a professional's conference. <laughs> Behave like a professional, not a pastor. <laughs> All right. I'll try to be professional. Okay. Two. So once you do that, now you can plan your year, your month, your week, your day. I like this quote from Stephen Covey. He said, the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but you schedule, build your schedule around your priorities. So how will you know what your priorities are? Well, you've done the exercise step one. So now we know in this particular season in which you are, there are different people in different seasons. In the season in which you are, what are your priorities? Now build your schedule around your priorities. So here's what we do. Uh, in the season that I'm in, which I shared earlier, this is how I do it. 
the first thing I do is we plan the church calendar. So in the month of October, last month, our calendar for 2024, church calendar, was filled. We made it. We completed it. So basically as a church, we know what we have planned for 2024. It's done. So we know when we're going to do all the conferences, we can school, everything that we normally do as a church, 2024 calendars planned. I've sent it out to our pastoral team. Pastors, everybody know. This is our, 20, our staff. They all know. 2024 calendar is planned. Then, around that calendar, we, I also plan the, the pulpit plan, which is, see, as a pastor, you only get 52 times a year to preach. <laughs> it's just not enough. It's like, God, I need 104 at least. You know? It's only 52 Sundays. Only, God, I have only 52 chances to preach. You know? So, it's very easy, right? So, um, my next step is to plan the pulpit calendar. What are we going to minister for 52 Sundays? And, of course, you're listening to God and saying that this is where the church is. This is what God wants us to impart to the church in 24. So, usually, the pulpit calendar is planned by the time we finish the previous year. So, uh, I'll be sitting down in December uh, in about three, four hours. 2024's pulpit calendar is done. Shared with everyone. So, okay, these are the topics we're going to cover in 2024. So you've got the church calendar done. You've got the pul pulpit calendar. That means the year is planned. The next step is to fit in my personal things into that calendar. So for many years, uh, there were two, two things that were very important. That means two, two vacations every year. So as the kids were growing up, that would then go into the church calendar. and Say, okay, now I'm going to block these two weeks which will be the family vacation time. Even if Angel Gabriel came and said, I said, Gabriel, I'm going on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I planned it in December. You're too late. No, no it's just okay. The point is that I've got the church calendar, I've got the pulpit calendar, and now I put in my personal things. That means I'm blocking out time in the whole year's calendar. These are family vacations. They're non-negotiable. Uh, this is time for family. So be, that is priority. Are you with me? Your family is priority, so you're putting it in. Then, so all of this is done in a simple Excel sheet, which all of us know how to use. Very simple. It's all done. It doesn't take much time. And then I take that, and then I use Outlook, where I plan my month and my week. So I go from the year to the month and the week. So now I can plan out what's going to happen every month, because I know the church calendar, I know my personal calendar. It's now put in outlook. I know what's going to happen every month. So then I can manage week to week. So when people call and say, I want to come and meet you, I know when I can schedule them, because everything is already planned. Are you with me? Yeah. So plan your year, month, week, and day. And for most of us, I think we can do this. It's not, uh, I understand that, you know, your employer could call up anytime and say, hey, I need, to go on an, I need you to go on an assignment here and do that. And that was not, you didn't foresee that coming. That's okay. You can adapt. You can adjust or rework your schedule. But with the information you have today, you can definitely plan 24, 2024. You can put it down. And you can put prioritized things that are important to you, your family, your time with your family, so on and so forth. You can put it down. And if something disrupts, you can always reschedule. You can rework that. But at least you have a plan that you're looking at. So other things, when you, when you, when you have a plan like this, you're able to track where you're spending your time. Otherwise, people, where did your time go? I don't know. It's March already. I thought the year just started. I just attended New Year's service last Sunday. I heard the word of the Lord and it's March. <laughs> like I haven't woken up to the word of the Lord yet. <laughs> it's still <laughs> permeating my spirit. You know? So time just flies and we don't know where it's gone. But when you've planned this and you've got it in front of you on your outlook, you know, I can go back and tell you what I did. You know, uh, this month, this week, this is what happened. And as we're doing this, we also are able to say no to distractions. 
So when kids were growing up, every Saturday morning, I'd go play soccer with Josh. And some of, some of you guys remember that, you know. Uh, that was fixed, Saturday morning. So if somebody comes and says, we have a conference, Pastor, can you come? No, I already have an appointment. I have to go play soccer with Josh. I can't come and preach in your conference. That's out. Why? That's priority. Right? I had to take my kids to music class. I take every Saturday. That was in my calendar. We'd go to sanctuary, have a sanctuary special, and Josh and Ruth go for music class. Come back. I was every Saturday. I would not accept anything else on that Saturday. So I know what to say no to because I have something more important already in my calendar. And I don't feel guilty about it because this is more higher priority than what I'm saying no to. So doing that is important. Also, as part of your plan, allocate time for deep work. What is deep work? Deep work is something you're doing where you're fully focused on that one thing that you're doing with no distractions. Um, if you're designing a software system, if you're designing a system, it's deep work. Usually, you know, I love, just sit down, just work on it. I don't want anybody to disturb. Not checking my email, not answering the phone. Uh, designing a system. Or you're writing a book. Or, you know, whatever you're, whatever you're doing. That requires deep work. That you need to focus. Uh, you need to be creative. Uh, you need, it's using a lot of brain power. That's deep work. Focused. So, in order to do deep work, you need to understand. You need to practice time blocking. That means I'm blocking out between 9 a.m. to 12 noon today for doing this one thing. That's deep work. Nobody's going to, you know, whatever comes. I'm not doing anything else. But that's where you're going to be most efficient. So when I sit down to work on a book, I'm doing deep work. I'm not going to do anything else. Sometimes, you know, for example, this Timeless Principles Workplace, it, that deep work extended for many weeks. I just sat and wrote. That's it. Not doing anything else. It was almost like, He's gone. He's raptured for a few days. <laughs> but I'm doing time blocking because I need to focus. It requires that kind of effort to do that. And don't multitask. You know, sometimes we think, oh, I can multitask. Actually, you cannot. Your brain cannot multitask. You think you're multitasking. It's not. Um, we can go and research on that. But, you know, uh, limit your multitasking. Some things, yeah, we can, but actually your brain is not multitasking. It's processing them still in sequence, but it's happening so fast. You think it's multitasking. You're talking on the phone, you're driving the car, and you're eating. <laughs> and I don't know what else you're trying to do. So four different things happening. You think, wow, I'm multitasking. Right? But your brain is actually processing them in sequence. Uh, you know, there are some things you get away with multitasking. But if you want to do serious work... Uh, you know, you really can't multitask. Um, you need to minimize context switching. That means you focus on a particular context, and if you switch context, your brain, there's actually a lag in your brain. And how quickly you can think about this new subject is not as quick as we think. And I, and I know in, in, in normal work, we have to do context switching. Uh, so when I'm sitting in the office and keep the door open, so that means anybody can come and talk to me. So I may be on the phone, I've been listening to somebody having, you know, marriage blah, 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 so I'll finish it, close the phone. Then, you know, Hannah might come in, Pastor, she's talking about publications. So I've just been thinking about somebody's marriage problems, I need to switch context, I have to answer her question about what to do with APC books. And as soon as she's done, somebody else might come, maybe a financial question, accounting person will come. I have to answer, switch context. Think about accounting. And as soon as that's done, you know, maybe a media team comes. Switch context. So you can do it, but it's not the most efficient way to be working. Right? Now, sometimes you have to do it because of the kind of position you're in. So there'll be those days when I sit in the office, I have my door open, anyone can come, but I'm actually switching context from all kinds of things. And it's, you know, I, I, sometimes I, it takes a little while to switch context. Okay, just tell me. You know, once this really happened, Hannah came and sat in front of me, and I couldn't get her name. <laughs> I was staring at her, and her name was not coming. And I literally asked her, what's your name? 
<laughs> she must have thought the pastor's gone. No, it was just that I had to switch context. I was doing something else. She walks in and sits in front of me, and I just couldn't get her name. You know, so sometimes there's that latency, there's that lag when you're switching context. And we think we are good at it, but actually it's not a very efficient way. So minimize how much you have to do it. But we can practice batch processing. What's batch processing? And those of you IT, you know, you know what I'm talking about. But generally, similar tasks, you can do it in, if you do it in that same block of time, similar tasks, then you will be much more efficient. So example. If you're working on scheduling tasks, like I'm talking, I mentioned about planning calendars, if I'm planning my, the church calendar, the pulpit calendar, and my personal calendar, these are all scheduling tasks. So my whole mind is geared towards it. So if I do three or four similar tasks in that block of time, I am doing batch processing. You understood? Okay, maybe. <laughs> but that's batch processing. And that is good for your brain. Right? You, can, you can work very efficiently. So try to do that. That means you club similar tasks together, and uh, you will be very good at that. And uh, another thing about planning is uh, to work ahead of time. All right, now I need to plan my time. It's 4. What's the time now? It's 4.18. All right, so we have time. Okay. So... Work ahead of schedule to avoid stress, right? So one good thing about, you know, we work the calendar. I send it out in October. Now Stephen can plan all. He can book the venues for next year. Aram, say. There's no rush. Like, hey, I need the hall. I need it tomorrow. No. He got the schedule in October. He can book all the venues for 2024 now itself. And that's what, you know, we're working on. So we do everything. There's no stress now because we've planned ahead of time. Our media team can start thinking about the graphics, and we, you know, we give out the sermons, um, the the uh, conference titles, and all of that ahead of time. Our different ministries, they can start looking for people. All of these things, people can work without stress when you plan ahead of time, and you yourself can work ahead of time. But you got to be careful of Parkinson's law. What is Parkinson's law? It's simply this: that work expands to fill the time available for its completion. And he actually came up with this law by observing people working in the government office. He's observing them. <laughs> and then he came up with this law. He said, you know, I'm noticing. If they say one month to do something, they will take one month to do it. Even though that could have been done in one hour. So that's Parkinson's law. That means if you say, I'm going to do this in one hour, I mean in one month, even if that task can actually be done in one hour, you'll take one month. You'll go all over the world and then finish it. So the key is to be realistic in your scheduling. And this is where, if you're a creative person, don't get angry with me. Because I'm going to tell you, sometimes these creative people, they say, oh, I need so much time to be creative. I say, no, the work has to be done in 30 minutes. Oh, I need time to be creative. No, you don't need. And I've worked with some of our graphics people. And we were, this was uh, you know, under tremendous pressure. I said, guys, we, uh, this was, you know, example in uh, 2020. Uh, we had to move our, all, everything online. We had to create our e-learning uh, Bible college website, e-learning for everything. And we had to do it in, like, in, in one week. And I said, we worked many hours. That I was working very closely with Praveen. And I would say, I mean, I need these, these graphics. I need all of this. I'm writing the content. We're building the website. There's information architecture. There's a flow. Uh, we had to get our e-learning portal set up, all of that. And we did it in a week. And I can tell you, if we were working for a big software company, it would have taken three months. And the quality of the creative work, the graphics that was done, if we had taken three months, it would have been no better than what was done in one week. So I can tell you, this is true. So when creative people tell me, you know, I need three months, I, I'll give you three hours. <laughs> because what you do in three hours, and what you do in three months will be no better than what you produce in three hours. Really. If you put your mind to it. So understand that, you know, you, you, you be realistic in your scheduling. So I purposely give very tight deadlines to our staff. Because I know you can get it done. 
if you just give them a lot of time, they'll go three cups of coffee. And <laughs> nothing wrong. I'm just <laughs> they will stretch. And he said, hey, I need it. When they asked me, when should I give it? Give it a tight deadline. They'll get it done. Yeah, just, I wanted, yesterday I wanted to get it, uh, three of them. I want to get a task. And they asked me, when do you want it? I, it was a little kind. I said, by Monday evening. They sent it all to me by this morning. <laughs> I was like, hey, see, you can actually get it done. Uh, so be, ha- be careful of this Parkinson's law. And, but, you know, so be realistic in your scheduling. Try to challenge yourself. Number three, I'll, I'll move a little fast. Um, use technology to improve your efficiency and productivity. Um, all of us are aware of these tools. And use tools that you like. There's so many tools available. I, I use simple things. I use Spreadsheet, Outlook. I use Google Keep. Of course, Google Drive to keep things there. Um, so what about tools that help you work efficiently? You choose work. Use them. Um, if there are repetitive tasks, um, try to automate them rather than trying to just um, doing them over and over again. Try to automate your tasks. Simple example, if you have to pay your bills every month, most of us, I think, already do this. You can set it on auto pay, right? So you don't even have to think about it. Your bill is automatically paid. So that saves you that time of logging in, looking at your bill, putting a number in, pressing, all that. just whatever you can, automate things. And uh, work smarter using technology. Uh, work smarter, you know, not necessarily harder, but work smarter, okay? Let me just move on to the next one. Very quick. So organize your world, especially your digital world. For all of us, most of our world now is digitized or is in digital form. Before it used to be in paper and files. And now where is the file? Where did I put the file? Where is the paper? Now everything is digitized. It's on your computer for most of us. But even with the computer, we can't find things that we need. Because when you save the file, you saved it as 2.doc. And then you don't know where do you find 2. What is 2.doc? <laughs> like, <laughs> DOC, right? You gave it a strange file name. So now you, I know I saved it in my computer. But where is it? Right? So there used to be an old saying in the old times, a stitch in time saves nine. Now we have to say, right folder, right file name, saves <laughs> right? Those days it was that. But now, think about it. If you digitize your whatever things that you have, you got to put it in the right folder, give it a right file name, it'll save you a lot of time. Right? And as you're organizing your digital world, the thought behind it is, hey, I don't want to do the same thing twice. How many times do you need to scan your passport? Every time you're asked to do it? Oh, I have to go scan my passport. <laughs> Only once in 10 years. I think <laughs> your passport is valid for 10 years. You need to scan it only once. How many times do you need to scan your other card? <laughs> Hopefully, you, know, you don't go around getting new other cards. But <laughs> if you have one other card, you need to scan it once your entire life. But how many times have you been scanning your other card? <laughs> That's a different story, right? Every time somebody has other card, oh, scans it. Why? Why are you doing it so many times? You just need to scan it once. Keep it in a safe place. Anytime anybody asks, here it is. So the important thing is, you know, there are tasks you don't need to repeat. Your PAN card, your other card, your passport, a lot of things. Scan it once. Put it in a place where you can retrieve it easily, and life is simpler. Your time, so much time, is saved. Okay. So the key there is, you know, um, I don't know if you can see this, but it's how you file, how you, you know, the file names you give have to be meaningful, intelligent. Now, here's something I've been practicing for naming all our sermons, and it's so useful. Now. It came from, you know, all the, 
the, the, the years of work in tech because there we had to, there's a, there's, you know, when you're, when you're programming, you follow certain naming conventions and all that. But I picked that idea up and I used it in, in the way I label our sermon. So every sermon document is prefixed with the month, the year, the month, the day, and then the title. So it's automatically sorted. So if you ask me, what did you preach on the 8th of January this year? I can tell you in 30 seconds. I preached on daily habits, daily routines. So it's all there. And it goes back till 2004. So if you'd ask me, what did you preach on the 8th of August 2004? Within two, three clicks, I will tell you what I preached. So from 2004, every sermon I preached is all there. So you ask me, I'll tell you. And this is how it's all published on our church website. All the sermons are there. So I don't need to struggle to find. And if I say, hey, I want to go back. And I remember I did a series on this. Uh, I just have to recall which year I did it. I go there. The sermon notes are there. I can pick it up. I can reuse it. I can preach it again. It's fine. It's all there. And all it has is just how you name the file, which folder you put it to, saves you so much time. It just is this one example. And like this, you can file and order your digital world in so many areas. I've got uh, the way things are filed in our personal documents for my wife and children, uh, uh, different, different things, all organized. So you ask me, I can bring it out for you in a few seconds. I can get it out for you. You understanding? So how you um, organize your digital world is very important. It's going to help you save a lot of time. I'll just give you some examples. Number five, a few more points, and then we'll go for questions. Um, think laterally. So every time you do a task, don't just focus on, okay, I've got to do this task, I've got to finish. But you also think laterally. And some of the things that you think laterally are like this. One, do I need to reuse this, or will, can I reuse what I'm doing right now anywhere else? So I'm, I'm thinking laterally. I'm not just thinking, oh, I'm going to do this task and do it. Example, yesterday I sent an email to our ID staff. Uh, we're doing some new work. So I was telling them, hey, we're going to follow this file naming conventions. This is how you're going to keep your file structure and so on. And I was sending, them it, sending it to them in an email. And that same moment I said, okay, hey, I'm going to take this and I'm going to document it in our systems design document. So I'm going to put it there because... As we keep building systems, we're going to follow the same thing. So that one email is now found a place in a systems, docu systems design document, which is going to be used maybe for generations. I don't know. Whoever's going to come and join our team and whatever systems we're going to build, we're going to follow that. So I'm reusing. I'm, I'm writing this only once, but I'm reusing it in many places. So you're thinking laterally. Are you understanding? Yeah. So just, just giving a simple example. Or when you, when you are doing a task, and you know one of the things that will help in delegating, you got to think, I know how to do this, but can I do it in such a way, and can I document this in such a way so that I can, somebody else can replicate the work? Because if somebody else can replicate the work, then I can delegate it. If, if I do it in such a way where I don't document it, and I, I'm not able to describe the steps very correctly, then I cannot delegate it. I'm stuck with it. So you're doing a task, but you're also thinking laterally. Can I do it in such a way that I can document it and pass it to somebody else? And so that I can focus on the things that I really need to do which somebody else cannot do. So I'm thinking laterally. Are you with me? So if you can document and make it something you're can be replicated, then you can delegate. And if you delegate, you're freeing up your time to do the things that are important for you. Same thing when you're networking. And we've heard about networking. But you think like this. This task that I'm doing, uh, and this again, I'm thinking laterally, are there people that I, that I can work with 
okay, or whom I can partner with, that they will be empowered by doing this instead of me doing it. I can do it, sure. But can I empower somebody else who in, 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 by just letting them do this? So they will be lifted up by me just giving them this work to do. So I'm networking, I'm building people up in the process, and I'm not just thinking about myself. And so I can call someone, hey, would you like to do this? They'll be more than happy to do it. Please take it, do it. Or thinking laterally, is there somebody else who can help me do this better? Maybe they've got information that I need to do this better. So I can talk to them, help me do better. So think laterally when you're working on things. It's going to help us save time. Number six. So it's very important to reflect, reprioritize, and reorder things. So keep short accounts. And for us as believers, the good thing is, you know, almost every day you have time for reflection. When you sit down to pray or read your Bible, it's also a time of reflection. How am I doing? And a simple question to ask is, you know, how are things in terms of purpose, priorities, and practices in, in this season? In this season. Think about it. Because, you know, we tend to drift. And sometimes we drift so far, it's December 31st. <laughs> it's like, did I, what did I think of doing the Jan 1st? It's a little too late. He has gone. So you need to reflect, if on a daily basis, if not at least on a weekly basis. Keep short accounts. Reflect. How am I doing? Am I staying aligned to the purpose? Are my priorities intact? Or now has something else taken higher priority? Uh, am I practicing, you know, spiritual life, healthy eating habits? exercise, whatever these, these things that are, whatever is important to you. Are you practicing it? If not, okay, bring it back. Bring it back. But you need to keep short accounts. Otherwise, too much time slips by and, you know, you wasted a lot of time. And as part of your uh, reflecting, reprioritizing, reordering, you know, take care of yourself. Uh, there's nothing wrong because if you take care of yourself, you can do better. You can be a better service to other people. It's not being selfish. I, I, I used to tell myself, when I take care of myself, I'm actually doing good to the people I'm serving because I can serve them better and hopefully serve them a little longer. <laughs> so taking care of yourself is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. You're doing good for others when you take care of yourself. And I'm talking about in a, in a proper way, right? Not, 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 talking, not, not, talking about, not talking about an indulgent way. And engage in continuous learning, you know. Uh, this is so important because everything around us is changing. Uh, there's uh, so many things are happening. And unless you... Uh, it, 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 it's changing many times in, in for, good, for good. So if you can leverage and take advantage of all the new things that are happening, you can work better, work smarter, save, save your time, and so on. So engage in continuous learning. Learn the things that you are interested in and, uh, and keep growing in those areas. The last point I'll tell, speak on this and then we'll take questions. The life plan. Now, I shared this with, you know, over the years, uh, I've shared this with different groups of people. Uh, some of you may have seen some of these things before. And if you're seeing it again, it's okay. Just pretend you've not seen it <laughs> before. Uh, uh, the Lord, God speaks to us ahead of us. Uh, ahead of time. So when God formed you in your mother's womb, he had a plan for you. He had a purpose for you. He designed you for that purpose, like we heard earlier. And so he's not going to say, hey, I made you for a purpose and I'm not going to tell you what it is. He's going to say, I made you for a purpose and I want to help you discover that purpose. Right? That's our God. And so we should seek out God, what is your purpose? And he reveals things to us. He shows us things in advance. And so listen to God. And part of the thing that we want to do is, and uh, uh, again, you're welcome to disagree with me, right? This is just something I, I like to think about, the way I like to think about. You like to live in the intersection, the yellow zone. 
in the intersection of your competencies, your passion, and your opportunities. That means, what are your competencies? Of course, some, you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about this, but very quickly, competencies can be acquired. Some of them may be innate, but they can be acquired, but all competencies have to be developed. Passion, passion may be discovered, may be influenced, but all passion needs to keep kept motivated. Opportunities, God provides opportunities sometimes. You get on LinkedIn and find your opportunity, right? And that's why you need to listen to Eddie James. <laughs> so opportunities, God provides, but sometimes you've got to make it. You've got to knock the door. You've got to open up the opportunity. And when they come in, you've got to seize it. So you live in that intersection zone, in the yellow zone. And that's the place you want to live your life. Okay? Think about it. So, in order to do that, very quickly, um, this, this is something that I that this just happened in my life. So, in 1993, I sat down, just listening to God. I said, this is what I'll be doing the next 10 years of my life. And I wrote those things down. Get married, move to India, start a business, um, start a church, travel and minister. I wrote those things down. This was 1993. 2003, looking back, all those things were fulfilled in those 10 years. And so that encouraged me and I said, hey, if God could reveal to me what I was going to do in the, in the 10 years up ahead, then maybe I can just sit down and listen for the next decades of my life and write it down and see how all of that unfolds. So I did that. And, uh, and, and then I came up with what, you know, I'm just referring to it as a life plan. So I, I divided my life in decades. I'm not saying you should do this. I'm just saying what I did. Okay? If you think I'm crazy, say, no, no, no. I do not even think about tomorrow. You're thinking about decades. Forget it. <laughs> it's okay. Right? Live as you would. You're comfortable. But this is what I did. I, I, I divided life into decades, listening to God. I said, in this period, what should I be doing? What would that the, the focus of that decade be, can I describe it in one sentence? So that I wrote it down, that decade, one sentence. In order to fulfill that one sentence, what should my objectives be? And in order to fulfill those objectives, what should my plans be? Got it? So I did that all the way. And, you know, very interesting. And I worked on this last in 2010. In 2010, I said, in 2015 or thereabouts, 2015, I'm going to exit business. Because I'm foreseeing that the church is going to grow. It's going to require all of my time. I have to exit. So I wrote that in 2010. I put it down. The sexual seed is there. It's proof. In 2014, I did exit. It did come out. So it's, it's looking back. I can see. Now, not everything is fulfilled. I'm just carrying over things. But I have a sense of direction for every decade. This is what I'm going to focus on. And this is how I'm going to do it. And some things have happened much beyond uh, my expectations. You know, um, I said that in this year, in 2021 to 2030, we'll affect cities and nations, we'll reach nations. And today, uh, in 2023, and we are already impacting every nation on earth through the technology. So more than, tw around 200, more than 190 nations are using our resources online already. It's already happened. And I, I don't have to travel there, no need to get on a flight, no need visa, no need air ticket, nothing. People from the nations are using our resources. It's already happened well ahead of time. So I can just look back and say, like, look, these things are happening. So I want to encourage you to think about that and do it. I close with this. Until you value your life, you will not value your time. And until you value your time, you will not invest it wisely. So start off valuing your life. Your life has meaning. God created you for a purpose. You've got to live for that purpose. Value your life. You've got meaning here on earth. And whether you like Steve Jobs or not, you're, this is what he said. Your time is limited. Don't waste it living someone else's life. I'll close with this. Psalm 90 verse 12. Teach us, Lord, to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. God. Be conscious about how you live your life so that you can live it wisely. All right. Time for question and answers. We have 20 minutes. Oh, we have four minutes. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. What one? Question. Last scripture was Psalm 90 verse 12. 
Hello. Shika. Hi, Shika. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Pastor? <laughs> um, I think my question is, um, I think I filled it in my form as well. Like, um, as a consultant, people who are not working somewhere as a full-time job, they're working part-time jobs during the week. Um, you know, you're going in different organizations throughout the week. You're working with different kinds of people throughout the week. Um, I know, like you said, we are not built for multitasking, and you did speak about context switching, which I think would help me, but um, if you could provide some practical tips for people who just consult at different places, how can you manage your time better? And because you're doing different tasks throughout the week, so you know, switching from uh, one job to the other, and how can you do that in a more effective and a more smooth way, if that's clear? Okay, but but all of this is in the same domain, or are you shifting? Are you uh, switching sh domains? Shifting fields as well. Oh, okay, yeah. shifting fields as well. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, yeah, having blocks of time. So let's say you have three different clients. I just call them clients. You have three different clients for whom you're consulting, and they're in three different areas or domains or fields. Um, and you know that maybe Tuesdays I'm going to meet this, spending time with this, Wednesday with another client, Thursday with another client, or however that works for you. Um, I think having that set time is, is good. Now, I know in some practices, you know, it's like you're on call, so uh, any client could call you anytime, ask you questions. So it's, it's a little more difficult. You have to switch context. You're forced to do that. But if that's not um, how you, uh, you know, it, that's not relevant in your work, in your work, uh, having set days, set blocks of time would really help. So you can actually prepare ahead of time. You know, you know, on Sunday, you know that this week, these days, these times you're meeting with people, your mind is being readied for that. So that really helps. And you can also prepare in advance what you're going to say, what you're going to do, and so on. Um, and as... And as you become, become an expert, uh, I'm not saying don't prepare, but as you become uh, you know, very uh, adept or uh, you know, you're more proficient in whatever you're doing, the amount of preparation decreases. Because now it's more of you are the subject. You are the one who's bringing that in. So for example, and I don't tell people outside, I don't really prepare for my Bible college lectures. <laughs> <laughs> Because I am the, I, you know, it's like I say, hey, my last 40 years is a preparation for this one-hour lecture. So I'm, I'm not coming to deliver, you know, I've read my notes and I'm coming to talk to you. That's not how I prepare. It's my 40 years I'm bringing into the classroom, right? So I just get there and I start talking and, you know, of course I'm following the notes and sharing. But it's more of, for these lectures, it's not about me bringing content off the page. It's me bringing my life to you. That's how I look at my Bible college lecture. So I don't really prepare. I mean, I might five minutes before the class, okay, I know you need to cover these things. But it's like, okay, I've taught these for 40 years. Uh, I know the content already. My life is lifted. So I just speak to you out of it. You know, so, so for me, you know, uh, I have to switch from Bible college lectures to pastoral ministry to all kinds of things. I keep switching. But I can do it because I'm not really, I don't have to, take so much effort and time to prepare for those lectures. I just go and talk and, you know. So, so what, what I want to say is don't, pre I'm not saying don't prepare. I'm saying as time progresses, you become more proficient in what you're doing, then you are the message, you know, uh, and become so much easy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, don't tell the students. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Okay, no questions? Yes, Alice. You need a mic. So we plan for the season. Um, uh, the monthly, daily, weekly, everything has been planned, and suddenly some uh, unplanned <laughs> ad hoc or situation jumps in front of you. And you have to prioritize that as well. Include that in your schedule. And that time, how do we like really balance or focus on the purpose for that season? Yeah. So if it is a, a, a solitary event, you're rescheduling things for that day. 
and it might overflow or impact the subsequent days. And, but you're getting things back on track if it's just something that happened for that day. But if it is a shift where, you know, several weeks are affected, it's okay. So while you're planning, you're also staying flexible. You're also, you know, keeping things fluid. So you're accommodating changes. I'm not saying we're rigid, but you're accommodating changes. Uh, and then you get things back after that, you know, three, four weeks or whatever you need to do to accommodate, you get things back and then you move. But those things do happen in life, right? That's the part where my times are in his hands, right? Where I've done my part, but then something happens where things are disrupted. It's okay. God is with me. Journey through it. Reschedule. Reprioritize. Reorder things. And then get back to what you, are, what you need to be doing for that season. Thank you, Thank you Pastor. Uh, Pastor, I don't know if that's a continuum, but uh, were there times in your life where there were seasons where you absolutely don't know why, what's happening, but you know deep in your heart that the Lord is in control? Um, you pretty much are not able to make head or tail of it. Um, would you mind throwing a little light on that? Uh, because... Because the only way um, I probably would understand in that perspective, in that space, I'd only look at it as just knowing that the Lord is in control is the purpose sometimes. But would you like to throw a little more light into it? Sure, sure. I'll just share a couple of things. One was, um, like when I went to the U.S. to do my graduate studies, my thought was I'll go there only for two years. I said, I'll go do my studies, come back. And then the goal was always, I'll come back to Bangalore, start a church. And I had that desire to kind of start a company. I just didn't know when, how, whatever. But my plan was to go there for two years, come back. But then it just, things just happened so differently. And, um, and I stayed 10 years. But I didn't lose sight, like you said. I didn't lose sight of the purpose, meaning I know I'm going to go back to Bangalore, start a church, and do the work. But I readjusted myself, and I said, okay, whatever time I'm going to spend here, I'm looking at it as a preparation time. Right? So in that sense, yeah, uh, did I fully figure this out? No, I didn't understand it. But I, 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 in my thinking, I repositioned myself and said, I'm going to stay here. Uh, I'm going to prepare myself well, learn all that I can, so that when, I, when it's time to go back, and I'm ready anytime, Lord, you, whenever you say go back, I'll go back. But I want to make sure that when it's time for me to go back, I want to go back saying I'm well prepared. So I, that helped me reposition myself. So that was one season. Now, 2010, 2011 was a very difficult season in our lives, in uh, Amy and me, our, our lives. So this was like after the church had come and we, you know, everything was going on and we are now 10 years into this. It's a very difficult time. And, and honestly, that 2011, yeah, was a year when it was, it was like, God, I don't know what's happening. I stepped down from preaching for four months. I got 12 pastors who were there. I said, first four months, 2011, I said, I'm not going to preach. I'll just come and sit in the service. Because emotionally, things were so bad. And I should come and sit in the service. And then it came to Easter. And they said, you have to preach on Easter Sunday because everybody's going to expect the pastor to preach. So that's the only reason I came and preached on Easter Sunday. But that four months, I, just, I would come to church. I would just sit. And I said, OK, I'm not going to preach. You know, uh, and uh, emotionally, it was very difficult. And uh, uh, we scheduled different people to preach. We had different pastors preaching. We invited people from outside to preach. But that was a very difficult season of life. But I didn't understand everything that was going on. But I said, God, I know you will take care of things. Right? And then, yeah, so it, it was that four-month period. And then, you know, I was uh, able to come back and continue serving God. But... I just stayed the course. I mean, but I used to spend a lot of time in prayer. Like, I just pray sometimes. Because I didn't understand what was happening, my only recourse was, I'll just pray. 
So I'd go to my room. I said, God, I don't know what I'm praying. I'll just pray for eight hours. Like I just pray in tongues. I'll just be praying for eight hours. I said, God, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's, I, I, I can't make sense of what's going on in my world. But I know I can pray. I'll just pray. And you do the work. Right? So that's kind of what I did during those, basically for most of those, you know, those, those, that very difficult time. Uh, uh, but I was there. I was, I, you know, I would just be behind the pastors. They were front-ending everything. But my main thing was, oh, God, I'm going to pray. I just, I just need you to work. And then God just worked things out. So I can look back at that season and, you know, and say that, yeah, uh, it was very difficult. But God worked and brought us out. And we're still alive. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Yes. There's a question there. All right. Um, yeah. So it's time. Uh, hello, Pastor. This is uh, something which I frequently struggle with. So uh, there are times when you schedule your uh, week and you also schedule to the level of the day at that granularity. But, you know, what happens sometimes that uh, your, your known people, friends, might come up to you and suddenly say, hey, I, can you help me with this? You know that your day is jam-packed and you have taken care of everything that you need to do on that particular day, probably family, work, office, health, and you have no time for that. But uh, very frequently you get requests like that, can you help me with this? Uh, it's difficult to say no because you know that person and you're in a dilemma that you know, saying no to him or her would you know, uh, impact the relationship which you have. Uh, how to deal with that kind of situation. And also, there are, uh, there are situations where people come up to you and say, uh, hey, Leonard, uh, can you uh, build, this, uh, build this, probably a poster for me? Or there's a website for me, can you set this up? I can do that, one can do this, but there's your effort required, your time required. Right. And if there's time required, which means you have to say no to many other things which you have already planned. And, uh, uh, the person may not have budget and may, uh, may is asking for help. How to <laughs> handle or say no or you know yes? To, uh, I'm handling in a way that relationships are not impacted. Uh, there might be things which can be done over a simple WhatsApp, but they would want to call you, and they say, "Let's meet, let me you know I'll talk to you for two, two minutes." But that time, two minutes becomes thirty minutes, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you c could uh, throw some light on how to you know politely mm. say no or you know handle the situation, <laughs> uh, that would be uh, great. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's good that you, you recognized um, these demands on, on time. And uh, the, the important thing, again, there is to look at your priorities. And like, like if you, you've already put things down in your day schedule, and if the request is important, then yeah, you, you can accommodate it. Like you, you go for it and help them. But if it's not in that order, level of priority, then you know, you, uh, you don't feel bad in saying no, that you can't do it, or that you would be able to help them later. I think we just have to think of ways where we communicate that uh, politely and say, hey, I can't do this. So, for example, I, I can just, just from my own life, look, if people are calling me and saying, you know, uh, we need to talk to you, and which happens, you know, people in the church, we need to talk to you. Um, there is the understanding that, sure, I'll, I'll give you time, but it may not be today. Right? It may be next week, week after. It just depends on what's, what's coming up. So uh, I would say, look, I can't meet you this week. Next week, again, it's full. Week after is full. So I will meet you three weeks from now. Uh, and it's a practical thing. I just can't do it because those two weeks have already been scheduled. And uh, if they say, uh, it has, there has to be something very good reason. I'm about to jump off the cliff. <laughs> you need to come. Now, you know, something it's very drastic that, has, that would cause us to drop everything to go and meet. And, but in most of life situations, that's not the case. You know, it's not that somebody's always on the edge of the cliff about to jump. It's not like that. Uh, they may make it sound like that. <laughs> they may make it sound that they've already jumped. <laughs> and they're calling you on the way down. <laughs> They could make it sound like that, but that's where a little bit of discernment is required. And you say, okay, I, you know, it's, it, it may not be as serious as they make it look. And so this can wait. 
you know. So I think you'd make those judgment calls and don't feel, uh, don't have any guilt that you're saying no, because there are things that are more important uh, in your world, things that you're responsible for, equally responsible, maybe more responsible for. So there's, there's no shame in saying no to something. Right? So you make that judgment call, depending on what it is, communicate that back, see when you can accommodate it. And if some things are, you cannot, you say, hey, I cannot do it, you know, practically. Otherwise, you're just going to stress yourself by taking on things beyond what you can. Okay? Thanks. All right. Any, any more questions? Otherwise, we'll close. Okay. Hand it back to you, Tina. Thank you.